This is going to forever change the way you see the parable of the prodigal son. What I always thought was just a story of a sinful man is actually part of something much bigger. A very pointed message to tax collectors and sinners, to the Pharisees and the religious leaders. And without understanding this, we are liable to miss the deeper meaning of the entire thing. Something that was obvious to Jesus' audience, but is lost on most of us. At least, it was lost on me. Curious to know what it is? Well, then join me for part one of this two-part episode of Misreading Scripture. Now, before we start, if you haven't done so already, make sure to go back and watch part one of my teaching about this parable, where I explain why Jesus' lead up to this parable, two other parables about lost sheep and a lost coin, are critical to understanding the parable of the prodigal son. You'll actually find a link up here and down in the description. And if you're interested in learning more insights that will help you to understand the Bible more clearly and see it with an entirely new set of eyes, then make sure to click the link above and down in the description where you can download a free book I wrote called 10 Words That Will Change the Way You Read the Bible. It is a quick but powerful read that will teach you a whole lot in just a short period of time. Just like this video. Speaking of, let's dive in. As Jesus begins the parable of the lost son, he says, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. So he divided his assets between them. And after not many days, the younger son gathered everything and went on a journey to a distant country. And there he squandered his wealth by living wastefully. Now, Jesus may be doing a lot of things in this parable, but one thing he is definitely not doing is being subtle. Because if you remember, Jesus is standing before tax collectors, sinners, Pharisees, and teachers of the law as he offers his teaching. He's been criticized by the Pharisees and the teachers of the law for associating with the tax collectors and the sinners. So what he's offering through these parables is an argument against their criticism. And in his opening illustrations, the parables of the lost sheep and the lost coin, he's been fairly gentle. Right? The sinners are the lost sheep and the Pharisees and religious leaders are the shepherd. The sinners are the lost coin and the religious leaders are the woman. He's reminding the religious leaders of their responsibility to seek those who are lost. And the sinners are treated somewhat like innocent victims, right? But not anymore. Because now Jesus' intent here isn't to shame the sinners and the tax collectors. He just dropped the subtlety now and named things for what they are. The son in this story, the man who represents the sinners, has made a terrible choice. And I'm not even sure we appreciate how terrible it is. Because in Jewish society, the father was responsible for the entire household. Everyone who lived with him was under his care. He would feed them, fight for them, rescue them, and make decisions in their best interest. And when he died, that responsibility and a double portion of his inheritance would go to the oldest son. He was now going to be responsible for the family, so he needed the bulk of the resources. And the younger son or sons would get the remainder. But look at what the younger son does here. He asks for his portion of the inheritance before his dad is dead. Not only is he saying, Dad, things would honestly be better for me if you were dead. Can we just hurry this along? He's also saying to his entire family, I don't care what happens to you. I mean, the resources that he's taking are resources that the father would otherwise be using to care for and provide for the entire family. But the younger son is taking them all for himself, regardless of what that might mean for everyone else. But as if that's not bad enough, it gets worse. Because look at what Jesus says that the son does with the money. Jesus says, the younger son gathered everything and went on a journey to a distant country. And there he squandered his wealth by living wastefully. Now, two things are really important to notice here. First, he takes this wealth to a distant country. In other words, he takes it to Gentile territory. And this is confirmed by some later things that happen. But then second, Jesus tells us that he squanders it. And this would have made even the tax collectors and the sinners appalled. You see, there was a rule at the time of Jesus that anyone who lost the family's money to Gentiles would be banished from the community. In fact, in the following centuries, there would be special ceremonies to codify this excommunication. This is what the younger son has done. He has lost the resources of God's people to Gentiles. He shamed himself, his family, his community, and he won't be welcomed back. 
which is why we see him descend so deeply into poverty. I mean, he plummets so low that he even becomes envious of pigs, which is important for two reasons, right? First, it confirms for us that he is in Gentile territory. Pigs were considered unclean in Judaism, and you'd never find pigs in a Jewish town. But then that also illustrates the second important thing about this inclusion of pigs, which is that it tells us just how lost this young man is. I mean, remember, like I said, Jesus is no longer being gentle or subtle. He wants even the sinners around him to be shocked by the sin and the state of this younger son. He needs everyone to see just how terribly lost this young man is. I mean, he has no excuses. He has no reason to be let back into his family. In fact, Jesus includes one more small criticism of the younger son while he is in this rock bottom state. When the son finds himself starving to death, he says, how many of my father's hired workers have an abundance of food and I'm dying here from hunger. I will set out and go to my father and I will say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired workers. Now, on the surface, it might seem like the younger son has reached a place of repentance. But when we look closely, we realize that it's, it's really not that simple. While he does plan to tell his father that he has sinned and he's unworthy to be his son, he does so for a purpose. He has no other options. He can't find any other way to live. He knows that his community will reject him, and he has no other community to turn to. So he plans to use his confession to get a job, a job working for his father. It's not repentance for repentance sake. It's an apology with a purpose. It's not necessarily about remorse. It's about survival. And I'll be honest, right? I'm not sure we're supposed to like the younger son at this point. I'm not sure we're supposed to feel sorry for him at all. I think Jesus really wants us to see just how sinful and lost he is. Because when we view it through that lens, what the father does is all the more amazing. Jesus continues, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. When the father sees his younger son, he runs to him. In fact, the word that Luke uses here is treco. It's the same word that Paul uses when he's talking about running a race. This father sprints to his son. And here's the thing, men at that time didn't do that. It was shameful for a man to lift up his robe and run, especially to his son, a son who honestly shouldn't even be here, right? He should be banished from this community. But since he came back, he should be the one running to his father. But it's in this moment that we begin to see all the pieces of these parables come together. The things that Jesus said in the parables of the lost sheep and the lost coin begin to clarify what he's saying in this parable about the lost sons. Because in the parable of the lost sheep, he reminded the religious leaders that according to scripture, they're shepherds tasked with reclaiming lost sheep. In the parable of the lost coin, he highlighted how all the coins were of the same value, reminding the religious leaders that it isn't only the sinners and tax collectors who are lost, they're lost too. They've forgotten their purpose. And now in this third parable, Jesus connects all the pieces. Just as this son was not too lost or too far gone, neither are the sinners that they reject. And just as the father shames himself in order to redeem the lost son, they will need to shame themselves in order to redeem these sinners. Because in that humility, in that sacrifice, there's power. You see, Jesus says something else really amazing when he tells of the reunion of this father and this son. It's subtle and easy to overlook, but here's what it is. When the son finally reconnects with his father, he says what he was prepared to say. He says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But then notice what he doesn't do. He doesn't ask for anything. He doesn't ask for a job. He doesn't request a meal. His repentance is finally real. And what made it real? What caused this change of heart? The sacrifice of his father. Grace led to repentance, not the other way around. The son didn't have to be sorry and make things right in order for his father to run to him. His father ran to him and the overwhelming love and grace of that act drove him to repentance. This is what Jesus wants these religious leaders to hear. They don't need to wait for these sinners and tax collectors to make things right before they offer the Lord to them. 
He's inviting them to join him in showing them the love of the Lord. The Holy Spirit will do the rest. In fact, this is why Jesus ends the parable so awkwardly. For centuries, people have wondered why the story ends on a cliffhanger. Upon finding out that the father has welcomed back his younger son, the older son becomes angry. He doesn't understand why his brother receives a party after all the pain he's caused, but he has never received such a party for being a faithful son. And so the father responds, Child, you're always with me, and everything I have belongs to you. But it was necessary to celebrate and to rejoice because this brother of yours was dead, and he's alive, and was lost, and is found. And then the story just ends. We never find out what the older brother does, and that's the point. Because for Jesus, this is an invitation. He's inviting the religious leaders to decide, what will we do? He's saying, you are the older brother. You are righteous. This is without question. But in the end, the real question is, will you join the celebration? Will you be the shepherds that God has called you to be? Or will you turn your backs on all of it? See, this parable ends with you. In the end, these parables are about all of us, right? We are the sheep and the coins and the lost son. We're also the shepherds, the woman and the older son. We are people who so desperately are in need of God's grace and we are people who so desperately need to show it. For some of you, you're lost right now. And what you need to know is that you have a God who would shame himself in order to find you. Die on a cross in order to save you. That's how loved you are. And if you're someone who knows that love, who's experienced that grace, then Jesus is saying, show it. Don't wait for people to to be perfect. Don't wait for them to get their lives right before you offer them grace. Offer them grace. And the Holy Spirit will be the one who makes things right. So ask yourself, Where in your life do you need to experience God's grace? And where is God convicting you to show it? To offer it to someone or or offer it somewhere where you've been hesitant? Now in the Beyond the Words community, we have a prayer request section where you can actually post your responses to these questions and where me and others will pray for you as you work to do this. It's totally free. You'll find a link up here in the card or down in the description. And I really want to encourage you to take this next step and post something there. And then beyond that, if you'd like to see more videos like this one, videos that will change the way you see familiar passages of scripture, then just click this box right over here. Thank you so much for watching today. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time.